Good morning, dear Thai, <clears throat> dear beloved community, dear sisters and brothers and friends. So I'm, my name is Mitchell. <clears throat> hmm. I arrived in Plum Village about five days before the retreat started. Um, on the staff in the New Hamlet, uh, which is an interesting situation. Uh, I attended there a number of times with my daughter and my wife, and they got used to me and keep inviting me back to be on staff, and so that's where I hang out. So I got here a week ago Friday and met with Sister Twainim, and she welcomed me and said, oh, and by the way, on Sunday, you're giving a Dharma talk with <laughs> Brother Pop Jung. And so, ever since then, the anxiety and tension has been rising, right? <laughs> I've had 10 days to... So I, I want your help to uh, let go of some of it. So if we can all stand up, all stand up. So it's breathing in tension, <laughs> breathing out, relax. A big sigh. Breathing in tension, breathing out, relax. Ah, doesn't that feel better? Breathing in tension, breathing out, relax. All right, more energy, more force. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, whole body, breathing out. Last time. Breathing in. Ah. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> ah. Hmm. Sitting here this morning, I realized that this is nice to be with uh, Brother Fop Young here because there's, there's really two parts of Plum Village. There's this Vietnamese core that really gives us roots and that I mean, we're celebrating 50 years of um, the order of inner being and we're built upon this base in Vietnam of, of Thai Ty's training, Ty's teacher. What are we, 12 generations of the Linkui Dharma line? And, and the roots that just go so deep into Vietnam. So there's that part of us. And then there's this other part of people who've been attracted here from all over the world. So I came here 25 years ago. Um, and it was a different place. Uh, it was very small that uh, we had about 20 people in the upper hamlet, 24 people in the lower hamlet. That was it. We had one monk in addition to Thai, my good friend Thai Tan from Washington. And we had four novices. I think the only one still remaining of those four is Brother Fop Dong, who's now the senior monastic, in Plum, senior male monastic, senior monk, who's now in California getting some medical treatment. And then in the lower hamlet, there was uh, Sister Chong Kong, of course, and uh, three Western sisters, uh, Sister Gina, who had just come, who was still in black and her black robes from the Japanese tradition and uh, um, Sister Eleni, Sister Chan Duke, Sister Annabelle. Actually, she was in the upper hamlet. She was the director of practice in the upper hamlet uh, among all these guys. It was an interesting time. Um, and uh, there was uh, two or three uh, uh, Vietnamese sisters I believe it was Sister Bao Nim and Sister Hua Nim, and a few novices there, and then these, these lay people. And it was, it was different conditions. Um, 
we lived in what are now the old stone buildings. Uh, Ty would give the Dharma talks in what is now half of the Upper Hamlet kitchen. We would set up chairs for like 40 people, and it was the warmest place because we had a nice you know, pot-bellied stove in there. None of the facilities anywhere had central heating. In those days, it was winter, right? I was here for the winter retreat. Um, we would scavenge wood during the day and cut it up and then burn it at night in these little leaky stoves. So it was a very Spartan life in, in all those ways. And it was wonderful. It was a very, uh, uh, got us down to essential, small community. Uh, Thai gave his Dharma talks in Vietnamese, but often before the Dharma talk, he would invite the Westerners to have tea with him in his hut. And we'd sit there and have tea and there'd be a little conversation back and forth. So Plum Village has changed in 25 years, as we all know, and that small monastic core now has about a thousand members. Uh, the Order of Inner Being, which was then maybe 40 people, is now up to about 4,000. And, you know, all the transformations that have occurred. And so I came here um, with an illness, a spiritual illness. I mean, much like Brother Fop Jung was talking about. And on the outside, I was doing pretty well. I mean, I had an interesting job, I had a house, I had a wife, I had some children, I had lots of education. And so I looked good from the outside, but inside there was a dissatisfaction, a dis-ease. Um, these sort of, uh, I was trained, you know, the, the culture just trained me in going after things and trying harder. And I grew up in this uh, materialist, consumerist culture. Actually, I grew up in Los Angeles, too, uh, right next to Hollywood, which is sort of the epitome of the facade, right? And um, so you would work harder and harder and try and get what was advertised as bringing in its happiness, but it didn't. It wasn't satisfying. It was satisfying for a little bit of time. Um, and we learned, too, that our suffering is complex. It's not a, you know, here's the cause and here's the answer, that there are levels and levels and levels. And part of it is from our ancestry. That my ancestry comes from Eastern Europe. My parents, my grandparents were Eastern European Eastern European Jews who lived in Poland, Belarusia, Slovakia. And that was hard. I mean, they were second-class citizens. They suffered prejudice. There were things called pogroms where the non-Jewish community would get excited about something happening and then just come in and there would be like a race war, just kill innocent people. Uh, for those who lived in the sphere of the Russian Empire, there was conscription, which they took young boys and kept them in the army for at least 25 years. I mean, so it's a tough life. And so they left when they could. They left in the 1880s, came to the United States. And part of that coming was letting go of the old ways. Back in the old country, there had been a very uh, structured, formalistic, orthodoxy. And so they came to the U.S. and let that go and wanted to be Americans and wanted the American dream. And so they let, let go of spirituality. It was an interesting um, way of doing it in that it became a tribalism. They let go of the religion but kept the ethnic identity or keeping the ethnic identity was forced on them because well, some people passed, pretended they were Christians, because it was easy to do. I mean, you looked more or less alike. But if you didn't pass, you know, you knew you were Jewish, but 
and the people I knew had lost that religion, that you weren't trained in it, you didn't have the values, you were spiritually alone, except for knowing you were part of this tribe. So that was sort of one suffering. That's the way my parents grew up, with the strong identity of being Jewish, but no content, no practice, no spiritual practice, no way of taming, uh, knowing how to deal with suffering, taming the, the unhappiness in life, taming the emotions. Um, so my parents were born in the United States and they grew up, um, when they were young people, there was the depression, there was a lot of suffering in their lives. Uh, I had a grandfather commit suicide during the depression. Um, on my mother's side, there were learning disabilities that were never diagnosed and pain. And so, as Tu was talking about yesterday, there was a lot of emotional closeness. closeness. And I grew up in a family <clears throat> where there wasn't a lot of connection. So part of my spiritual connection, my spiritual illness, was not having a spiritual root, not having a family root that was real. I grew up feeling very alone in my family. There was no one who I knew how to connect with and no one who's, who I thought saw me. Uh, and then there's the societal, you know, achievement, consumerism. And then there was my own life of, you know, trying to make this work and not having the skills to uh, to find a happiness and feeling a little lost. And it took some decades for this to mature because I kept hoping it would happen. I kept hoping I would grow up. And it didn't happen. And so finally I hit my 40s and really uh, was feeling this strongly. And I really f fell into the practice actually in, in Thailand. I was visiting Thailand on a work assignment. I had, to try to understand more of myself in the world, I became a social scientist. So I was, had some work in Thailand. And I had a week free and I asked to go to a monastery um, because I was interested in Buddhism. And I went to a place called Suan Mok, which is very famous in Thailand. There was a teacher named Ajahn Buddhadasa who was sort of the, 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 uh, Thai, the Thai equivalent of Thai. I mean, uh, he's a cultural hero and had really modernized uh, Thai spirituality and created engaged Buddhism in Thailand. He wrote a book called Dharmic Socialism. And he was one of the few Theravadan teachers who actually studied in the West, I mean studied Mahayana Buddha studied in Japan and other Mahayana countries and brought some of that back to his teachings. Came back to the United States, looked around for places to practice, practice with the Insight Meditation community for a while, IMS. But I needed something close to home and my Dharma brother Richard and I, years before, had been in a childbirth education class together. So we go back a long way. Our daughters are now 29. So somebody said Richard knew about practicing. So I talked with Richard and we met then at a Vietnamese temple in Washington, Yak Wan Temple. And it took me a while, some months, to realize Richard and Thay Yak Thanh and everyone else were students of Thay Yak Thanh, of, of Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, but I finally figured it out and then December of that year, 1990, Ty came to Washington and gave, was the keynote speaker at a conference called the Common Boundary Conference. And I heard Ty talk for the first time and, and my heart opened because he didn't talk like a Buddhist. I mean, he talked like a Buddha, right? I mean, he really, there's a difference. And he just, you know, how, like the theme, it was about suffering and, and the relief of suffering. And just very practical, very soft voice. And my heart opened. I mean, it really, it was an amazing transformative moment. 
Um, the next couple of days later, I went with Richard to visit Anhung and Tu and talk with Tai there. Uh, they asked, uh, there was going to be a retreat the next year. And so I, um, I was at, I, we had tea with Tai and then I got asked to organize this retreat the next year. And so I said yes. And myself and the community I was in, which didn't have a name then, because we were organizing the retreat, we had to give it a name. So we came up with the Washington Mindfulness Community. And so we did the retreat with 250 people in Virginia. Uh, and I had tea again with Ty. And I said, I love this practice. What can I do? And he said, come to Plum Village. And so I said, OK. And I think he was thinking I would come for two weeks in the summer. But uh, they were offering the winter retreat. And this still amazes me. So I had a family at home. I had a son in college and a uh, daughter who was four years old, and my wife. And I had a job. And I somehow convinced everybody it was a good idea for me to go to Plum Village for three months. <laughs> I mean, it's just, and partly it was being ill. I mean, it was like having a cancer and hearing there's a, a really effective treatment in Australia just for your type of cancer. And so you go. I mean, that's how deeply I felt touched by this. And so in these years, it's been 25 years now, I mean, I came with so much anxiety and tension and thinking and achievement and all this stuff. And overwhelmed by emotions so often. And so, I can't say they all went away, but instead of storms, they've become rain, right? You know, they, they've quite, all quieted down. And I've learned a whole lot about transforming my suffering. Um, and in this tradition, the, the patients become the healers, right? I mean, that as we learn to transform our suffering, we learn how to help other people transform their suffering. Um, and that helps us too. It's sort of like Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, that as you work with other people, it reaffirms, it deepens yours. Um, I've often thought of this community, the Western part of this community of being, um, well, let me, go back and say something else and then I, so, I, so you'll know the punchline. So that, that um, this quality of, of spiritual illness, I mean, in some ways we could call it the, uh, the disease of modernity, because I know I'm not alone. I mean, that there's many, many people in this room and in the world who've lost their spiritual roots, lost their family and community connections. And the word Thai uses is hungry ghosts. Uh, it's a word from Asia having to do with originally of people who died and who died angry. And, and that energy they kept with them or they just, and so they wandered, they were still upset and they were separated from their families and they weren't satisfied. They're portrayed as sort of these ugly creatures with really thin necks. And they're always hungry, but they can their necks are so thin, they can only eat a tiny bit at a time. And so it's, it's this constant state of hunger and trying to eat, wanting to eat, but not being satisfied, right? Powerful image. And so there's ceremonies to feed the hungry ghosts that are done in China and Vietnam um, as a way of making friends with them and keeping them happy so that they don't do bad things to the living. Um, and so in a way, I think of uh, Plum Village and all our sanghas as sort of alcoholic anonymous for hungry ghosts. I mean, that we bring all these hungry ghosts together and we heal together. And so it's with great gratitude I'm here today talking. Uh, and great gratitude for Plum Village, for Thai, for Sissi Chong Kong, for the monastics for my home sangha. The, my, started with the Washington Mindfulness Community for 
17 years, we created a community in Maryland called the Stillwater Mindfulness Practice Center. Uh, gratitude for my family, my friends, for all of you. I've got so many friends in the room, so I'm really grateful. Uh, and I told Richard earlier, you're, and I told too, I mean, you're up here with me because I'm, I'm speaking for all of us. So what I was told to speak about today <laughs> was the four foundations of mindfulness, which is really, you know, uh, this wonderful way to relieve suffering. And it, you know how books have uh, blurbs at the back that recommend them? This, The Four Foundations, has a wonderful blurb from, from a great author. It comes from the Buddha. And this is what he says. Uh, Dear students, there is a most wonderful way to help living beings realize purification. Overcome directly grief and sorrow. End pain and anxiety. Travel the right path and realize nirvana. Isn't that a nice book quote? So if I can get some help pulling this out. Uh, well, it comes just by now. Takes two. There you go. Push it back a little. Put it back. So it's, it's called the, the four foundations of mindfulness, or the four domains, four establishments, four ways to be mindful. So you, as uh, Thay Pop Jung said, I mean, I'm not teaching you anything here. I'm just reminding you what you know deep down in your heart, in your soul, in your storehouse consciousness. This is just the natural way that human beings work. So there's four of them. Uh, so I'm going to give you four poly words, because for me, the, the translations don't carry fully the meaning, and so it's helpful to know the poly. So this kaya, uh, which is body. Mm. There's vedana, which is usually translated as feelings. Um, we'll come back to that. There's citta, which is translated as mind or mental formations. And there's Dhamma, small d. So big D is Dharma, the teachings. Small d, objects of mind. And it's really all the things that, that we can discern, the individual pieces. So when I work with some Buddhist idea, concept, I like to start by saying, what is this the answer to? I mean, all knowledge is a conversation. And so it's really, what was the question that the community had, the Buddha had, that this is an answer to? So the answer, the questions I think the Buddha was, was raising was, what does it mean to be human? What, is the, what are our capacities as human beings? And also, how can we use these capacities to free ourselves and others from suffering? So in the West, we have a descriptive psychology. It's just anything you want to know, it's fine to study it. Just loose knowledge running around. This is very focused. It's really, how can we use this to relieve our suffering, to stop being hungry ghosts, to live more fully with more joy. 
And the other part is that, as Tai teaches, I mean, these sound like they're four different things, but they're really four aspects of one thing. And Tai often teaches this with coins, you know, right? You have the one side, the other side, but it's really one thing. And so I was working on this. If you've got a cube or a dice, right, it's six-sided. So how do we get four sides on something? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what I'm doing here. So can you see that? It's a tetrahedron, they're called. It's, imagine a three-sided pyramid that has, so let's call this mm, Kaya, and this is Vedana, and this side is Chitta, and then on the back side is Dhamma, right? It's like this little pyramid that, and it's, uh, they call them a, a a model tetrahedron if it's four equilateral triangles. But anyway, it's a neat. So that no matter where you are, it's just a facet. And it always contains the other parts. And there's lots of areas where it sort of mer merges together. So the first foundation is, is kaya, body. And we all, this is so much Thai's practice. It begins saying, well, find a, a place to sit that's comfortable, you know, under a tree, in a quiet building, and we focus on our breath. Breathing in, I'm aware of breathing in. Breathing out, I'm aware of breathing out. Sounds familiar, right? And then the sutra goes on. Breathing in, I know I'm breathing in a long breath. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing out a long breath. Breathing in, I'm breathing in a short breath. Breathing out, I know I'm breathing in a short breath. And it uses the image of the wood turner on a lathe who's mindful and knows how far he or she is cutting and knows when there's a long you know, spiral that comes off and a short spiral. So it's, it's the Buddhist teachings are full of these very concrete images. And then he continues, as, as Tai teaches us, you know, breathing in, I'm aware of my whole body. Breathing out, I'm aware of my whole body. There's another image. It's, it's he's like you have a sack of mixed beans, and you're told to notice, you know, there's the pinto beans, and there's the black beans, and there's the navy beans. We notice each of the parts of our body very deeply. And then it goes on um, to keep this awareness while we're walking. It teaches walking meditation. Keep it as we're lying down, as we're sitting down, as we're going to the bathroom, as we're eating. And so this kaya, is a, it's a stopping practice. It's stopping the discursive mind, stopping our thinking, settling. It's what I need to do, what needed to do so much. My mind was so active. So this was such a great gift of Plum Village. Thai often used to say um, that there's all these Vipassana communities, which is the Vipassana is the word for insight. But the other wing to Vipassana in the Buddhist tradition is shamatha, is stopping. And he, he, he taught stopping. He taught shamatha was his emphasis. We need both. But that usually people want to jump to vipassana, want to jump to the ideas, the insights, the story. You know, they're great teachings. But it doesn't become real until you know how to stop, you know how to settle down. Then you can actually experience and feel it. And the, the concepts mean more. So this is the heart of, of Plum Village, is, is all these stopping practices. And then the, the parallel to the 
four foundations is the, is the 16 trainings, which has the same four categories. And the idea is once you've, once you've settled some, then you can open yourself up to vedana, to feelings. Now, feelings in English is a huge word. It's everything from, I feel the floor beneath me. It's intuition. I have a feeling it's going to snow tomorrow or rain today, if that's more likely. Um, and it has this whole, you know, everything emotional is called feelings. And that's my understanding. It's not really what Vedana is or not all those things. So Vedana is this immediate response to stimuli that something arises in us and we just have a response that it's without thinking, it's immediate, it's short term. Let me give you an example. Think of your favorite dessert. Bring a picture in your mind. Oatmeal cookie, apple pie, whatever it is. So as you have that image, do you feel yourself leaning towards it? I mean, that's a good image. That's a smile that comes to you, right? So that's Vedana. That's Vedana. So let's change it. Let go of that. There's a lot of snails we see around here, right? Think of a squashed snail. Bring that to mind. Yeah. So there's this natural leaning back, right? Uh, think of, so let go of that. And if we think of just a zero, right? Think of that. Eh, for most of us, eh, zero. Not much of anything. So it's pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, right? And it applies not just to um, food, you know, or it applies to everything. So it could be attractive and not attractive. It could be tasty food and disgusting food. But this emerges so quickly, there's no thought, and it's always emerging. There's always, and we almost always, tell us we have training, don't notice it, because we're, you know, you see the dessert on the table and it arises and you're already grabbing it and taking it and starting to eat it. So this is the Buddha in his wisdom was saying, pay attention to this early beginning, the Vedana, this early feeling. In psychology today, they talk about hedonic response. Hedonic, you've heard of hedonism. I mean, that's somebody who's always looking after pleasure. So hedonic response is just that immediate pleasure of pain. They also talk about it as the felt part, that it, you know, the bodily felt part of emotion. So it's related to body. It's somewhere in between what we call emotions and body. Um, so you got that? And then in the sutra, and especially in the 16, they say to become aware of this and then to calm it down, to not immediately jump from that felt experience, that felt emotion into action, to just learn to calm it down. Um, and then we have chitta, mind. Um, Often people say mind or mental formations. It's interesting <clears throat> that the Buddha had just four things he wanted to talk about. And Vedana was <clears throat> one of them. And everything else mental is chitta. Everything else. All our emotions, our thinking, our cognitive processes, our will, all of that is over here 
as citta, as mind. And in the sutra, uh, the Buddha began with the three poisons. So it's anger or hatred, <coughs> greed, and confusion. So just staying with those for a moment, it gives you a sense of what cheetah is, is that when we're angry, it's this whole attitude. It's not just that immediate urge. It's, you know, you want to get back at the person or you're upset with somebody, you, you're plotting. That's an angry mind. We have a word that helps with cheetah. We say bodhicitta, right? That's the mind of awakening. So we can have dana citta, the mind of generosity. Anger, greed, and confusion. So those relate to vedana, what we've been talking about, right? That um, greed is having those pleasant feelings and wanting them to last, and really not caring what happens to ourselves in the long term or other people. We just want what we want when we want it, right? So we do things that harm ourselves and other people out of our greed. Uh, there's the unpleasant feelings. The unpleasant feelings feed into our anger. It's again, having these unpleasant feelings, not knowing what to do with them, and acting out in ways that hurt ourselves and other people. And confusion has to do with, eh, you know, indifference. The opposite of confusion is clarity. So what the Buddha said is pay attention to when you have anger and hatred or loving kindness, the opposite. Pay attention when you have greed or generosity, confusion or clarity. Um, and then he went on to talk about other mental formations like um, concentration, the malleability of the mind, the mind being open to um, higher states. So there are billions of mental formations, but in the sutra itself, he, he spoke of eight of them and their opposites. Okay. And the instructions is t are to, um, to become aware of them, to become aware of what our mental states are, what our mind states are, and to calm them down, to find some ease with them, uh, to be um, calm, to be clear, liberated. And that opens us to Dhamma, to the way things are. In the sutra, uh, the compilers of the sutra got into, well, this is a good time to teach basic Buddhism. And so the sutra goes on with this long list of the five hindrances, the five dull knots, the five sharp knots, uh, the seven factors of awakening, the four noble truths, the eightfold path. Because those are all objects of mind, they're ideas. Uh, what Thai teaches is that Dhamma, the things of the world, are the the smile of your friends, the birds singing, the trees, those are all dhamma too. And that we can become aware of them in this state. So we've gone, we've calmed the body, calmed the vedana, vedana calmed the citta, and now we can really be with things. We can be with our friend, we can be with the tree and just breathe with it, be with it. And that feels good. And so, Part of my spiritual illness, sort of close to what Fop Jung was saying, is that this, I had an orientation to, what's? Up? Oh. 
What? Continue? No, so, dear time. <laughs> um, So this is Ty speaking. <laughs> I think he's staying there for a while. He'll come in a minute. I'll stop whenever I'm told to. <laughs> so we have Ty's teaching. This is Dhamma. This is, uh, this is the world. And it goes deeper. I mean, as we explore, look deeply into all the things of the world, as Ty teaches, um, we see impermanence, right? We see non-self. We see interbeing, like with the, the four foundations. It's all there. And with that, uh, we, we find ease and joy. Where I was starting was that my orientation when I came here 25 years ago was a strong focus on external validation that what I'd learned as a child is I'm okay if other people say I'm okay. I'm okay if I get awards. I'm okay if I get prizes. I'm okay if people like me. I'm okay if I have more than you do. I mean, it's sort of comparative. If I you know, have a, at least as nice a house or whatever. I mean, it's all the comparative mind. That's external validation. And if that's all you have, you, be, you become very needy because all that disappears so quickly. You always have to worry about maintaining it. And what I didn't have, and what I began to get here, is internal validation, right? Internal validation is looking at a friend and just feeling good about it inside. Is looking at the tree and feeling the energy of the tree. Of doing a kindness for somebody and having that feel good to us. That's internal validation. So that's, that's what we get from the four foundations. I mean, it begins with the body, right? Of just feeling good, of stopping, and calming down these vedana and the citta, which drive us to do things that really aren't good for us. And getting clarity, seeing here, you know, what... Uh, what the world really is. I mean, what Thai teaches is that to live fully, we, we have one foot in this historical dimension. And we know that, you know, I'm Mitchell, and that's Richard, and that's Brigitte. And we have a home here, and we have a home somewhere else in the world. And there's li living in the absolute, the ultimate dimension, in which I know that Richard and Brigitte and Tu and many of you, are, all of you are in me. And I know that my home is here and my home is there. And when I'm back in Maryland, Plum Village is with me. And when I'm here, I bring Maryland here. And so this is a, a path of, of learning how to, how to grow in the world, learning how to relieve our, our suffering, because that's where it all started, right? And the Buddha said, this is, you know, this concrete path. And so, to finish quickly, just <laughs> that, um, you know, part of this is I've learned to use this in meditation, just as a way of sitting. So I sit down and I calm my body. And it, sometimes it happens quickly, sometimes there's a lot of excitement and anxiety. It takes longer. And then I, I check in on my vedana, check in on what's arising for me. You know, just that basic sense of pain, pleasure. Is my body comfortable? Am I feeling pain and unpleasantness around my eyes from being at the computer too long? Am I irritated from something that happened in the day? And I check into my mind states. Is there anger, greed, confusion? Is there dispersion? <coughs> Slowly I check into them, and then I open myself up to the world, and it becomes like in the Zen tradition, shikantaza. It's just open to oneself to whatever arises fully, 
seeing into it, non-being, uh, seeing into it, no self, impermanence, interbeing, nirvana. The other thing I do to quickly share is that when I have a suffering, a sadness, I go through this process with, with that quickly. And I, so I'll take my suffering to the cushion and calm my body and just get to know that suffering and just sit with it and go through these process and start asking questions. When have I had this before? What does it, what's arising with it? You know, what were the roots of this? And look at it. What, what was the precedent? How did I feed it? And so over time we get to know our suffering, all the different levels. And they're like garden hoses that have been crinked up so there's nothing flowing through them. Each of our sufferings prevents the, the energy to flow through us. And so as we can see into them, see how they arose, how we nourish them, bit by bit, we're untying what are called fetters. I mean, and it allows the energy to flow through us. And it's cumulative, so over time, there's more energy that's now available to flow through us. <sighs> I hope this has been helpful. It's really, uh, this practice has helped me. Uh, it's a wonderful practice. We have a wonderful community. And I'm so happy to see Ty here with us.
Thank you, Thay, for being with us. Listen to bell. And we bring all of our Sangha members all around the planet. We breathe with them. There's Thay everywhere, all around the planet. Breathe in. I agree. He's not just here with us, he's everywhere. Breathe in. Start to read already. You want to we read. breathe with Thai. Breathe out. We smile to Thai. Within us and all around us. And in front of us. 